Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 630 of the Agostino Zynga show, that's 630 of me talking through your eardrums straight into your heart, soul, mind and body and I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. How am I? All things good to be honest, all things good. Some other things are going not so well, but in terms of everything else, not so bad. I cannot complain. I'm actually enjoying the winter months here in the UK. It's absolutely snowing all over the place. And for some reason, trains have still been running. For some reason, I haven't seen many car crashes. For some reason, I haven't slipped and fooled and flipping cracked my head open on the pavement like I usually do. Because sometimes we get that thin sheet of like kind of ice, kind of sludge. And it can look really deceptive. It looks kind of soft, but then you put your foot in it and then... you just slip especially if you've got fancy cool trainers like i do that look cool that look fancy but they don't have enough grip on them the prime example being jordan ones jordan ones in this type of weather you're going to feel like you're wearing ice skates it's absolutely a madness but so far not too bad so i'm enjoying it and the nice little crisp little breeze out there it i don't know it just keeps you honest you know what i mean it keeps you alive it gives a little verve a little va va voom for life in the morning i absolutely am enjoying it um it's not been the funnest riding my bike out there in that cold but hey challenges are there to be conquered challenges are there to be conquered but apart from that what else has been going on oh so many things in it jesus feels like this week has been absolutely popping off with all the things happening in culture so i'm gonna dive on deep and just get right into it because i don't want to waste any more of your time and i want you to get all my nice tasty hot takes directly from my cranium into your earlobe so let's bloody go so the first thing that I went to speak about, of course, has been a thing that's been on everybody's lips, the Megan and Tory Lanez trial at the moment. It's been absolutely a long drawn out affair. It felt like it was never going to end. I think it's been three years since that whole thing happened, right? It feels like it's been far longer than that, but it's only been three years since it happened. And we are finally, finally going to reach a conclusion as to what happened in terms of Kelsey, the Megan's best friend, in terms of Megan, in terms of Tory Lanez at Kylie's house. And now we're learning that Corey Gamble was there because he's always there somehow in the background but I'm just curious to see how this trial actually ends up ending because there's been so many conflicting reports out there in terms of whose side you believe in terms of you know Megan's versions of events which is essentially that she insulted his music and that got him pissed off outside of the house and then that's when he started firing off shots or if you believe Tory Lanez's side of the events where he basically is saying that Kelsey aware that hey Megan's been obviously sleeping with me behind your back and doing all these other things you shouldn't be sticking up for her and because he revealed that secret to Kelsey dead the girls had a fight which then led to the gun being you know uh, discharge who knows who pulled the trigger but something happened but i think what we've got so far after day one and day two the one thing that we've got that's been definitely cleared up in court has definitely been this idea that she wasn't shot she was definitely shot now the definition of a shooting is you know it varies from person to person and from case to case and whatever it may be i've heard or i've read on some accounts that a shooting can occur or a shoot it can be listed as a shooting if you get hit with shrapnel that could still be something that could be deemed to be a shooting so this whole theory that you know whatever bullet that was discharged from the gun might have hit something that then smashed that then cut megan's feet up is still a possibility but this notion that she was never shot is definitely off the table so everybody else campaigning and basically making it seem like she made it up is not true because they found shell casings so the gun was discharged she obviously had wounds on her feet they were probably not you know um wounds that you maybe correlate to a shooting because essentially people always say you've got all these bones in your in your feet and all these ligaments and tendons and people who have been shot in the feet would definitely tell you that there's no way you can get shot in the feet and then suddenly be at dj khaled's house hanging out and twerking the next couple of days after it just doesn't happen that way she may have been lucky maybe one of those people you know those rare people that exist who you know they get shot and it's unfortunate but it happens to pass through every single bit of their body it doesn't hit any vital organ that could happen or any vital tendon or whatnot but for the most part we know that to be the truth the thing that is really disappointing i feel like for me in this case and something that's been a little bit troubling to kind of wrap my head around is that at the heart of it from what we can see if we're being objective from what we can see 
the reason why this beef started, the reason why they were all arguing, because at one point they were all having fun, you know, as um that famous Jordan Woods flipping interview always goes, it always makes me laugh. Whenever I think of the words or the phrase having fun, I always picture her head. I always picture her speaking at the red table and basically giving this impassioned speech as to why, you know, she may have just happened to sit on Tristan's lap and kiss him, <laughs> even though she, he, she, he happens to be the husband or the baby daddy of her best friend, sister, whatever. And it doesn't matter. At one point, they were all having a great, time so all in there frolicking the i think the the timeline of the events is that kylie invited megan and her friend to her house to come and hang out and then in the process of hanging out megan was like hey let's call tori he's in the area let him come and hang out kylie says cool bring him over this is during his you know um quarantine radio day so he's super red hot he comes over and hangs out and then somehow in the process of them hanging out things go left then that spills over to the car which then spills over to obviously the shooting so the things for me that's really sad and disappointing is that from what we can see so far it was definitely something that was you know kind of started off the back of their weird sordid relationship where essentially they were all kind of sleeping with each other but nobody was aware who was sleeping with who there was kind of like a weird love triangle thing going on and what i'm kind of getting which is my only inclination of this my only weird feeling of this is that i always wondered to myself like why would if if there's a, if they're if they're furious to believe that megan lied why would she lie like why would you kind of throw away your career or you know put yourself under so much unnecessary scrutiny you know for this it doesn't make any sense but then i was thinking back to it and i was thinking if you really think back to three four years ago what megan was to the culture what she meant in terms of being a fun girl an advocate for women an advocate for young girls you know hot girl summer she was really kind of the girl's girl she kind of you know went out of her way to kind of always be the one championing girls championing women's rights and all this good stuff it wouldn't really look great if it came out that not only are you extremely promiscuous which doesn't really matter really in the grand but just think about it from like a good girl i'm a girl's girl kind of thing you just think of them always kind of being around girls and having fun and not having time for boys and that can be an afterthought so not only are you extremely promiscuous but you're also somebody who seemed to take delight in smashing your friends um flings or interest you seem to take you know pride in the fact that you can also bag them as well this is what we're kind of getting at because it's also got revealed in the court that it was alleged that Megan had also slept with Ben Simmons, who, you know, prayers for him. I think he might be in a relationship, so he just got thrown in there, the baby. And all these people were obviously girls that Kelsey, the best friend, had also been with. So it kind of makes the image of this woman to be like the, you know, the champion of all women kind of crumble if you're there suddenly chasing after all your girlfriend's guys that they're with, whether it's relationships or, you know, people they're just hooking up with. It kind of doesn't look the greatest. So I can imagine in a place like Hollywood, in the entertainment industry at large, where your image is key, right? Your image is everything. That is who you are. You basically sell yourself based on your image, not not the not the strength of your character or anything or your morals or your principles, just the image. I can imagine why somebody in that case wouldn't want to, you know, the world to know that behind the scenes, this is what they get up to because it's going to make them look crazy. So, of course, you would try to paint the narrative that you were the victim of a shooting and that you have no idea why it happened. And this crazy lunatic guy shot you in the feet and told you, dance, bitch, dance. That for sure, I would have to completely understand it. But the really sad part of it, to kind of extend that, is that essentially what they want, is even maybe Megan more so, is you want to send a guy to prison who legitimately didn't do nothing from what we can see so far, who maybe in his head didn't do nothing. Maybe in your head, you know, didn't do nothing, but because you're embarrassed and you don't want to, you want people to find out what you get up to behind the scenes. You don't want people to have this other vision of you or other impression of you. You're willing to send someone into prison over a lover's tiff. It really does beg a belief in it. Like, and it goes to show that a lot of these people, even though they look big and grown, they're extremely immature because as dramatic and as horrendous as this experience could have is i feel like they could have still dealt with it behind the scenes it didn't need to go to this length it didn't need to go to this level but obviously we're here now so it has to kind of you know we have to reach a final conclusion to it but that's a really unfortunate part of it because at the end of this trial someone's career is going to get ruined whether it's 
Megan because it comes out she's a liar, whether it's Tory Lanez because it comes out that he's a, you know, he's an abuser of women and he legitimately shot someone because you hear stories of, you know, men in hip hop hitting women, maybe, uh, maybe strangling them to some, some regard or pushing them somewhere. But you've, it's been a long time since I've heard a story of a man in hip hop using a weapon against a woman, which is crazy. So for sure, if, you know, if people are getting counseled for hitting a woman in anger during an argument, just imagine what will happen with somebody if, if you get found guilty of shooting them. Absolutely insane especially somebody as beloved as Megan Thee Stallion even till now so clearly that's going to be a concern and obviously for the Kelsey girl who I would assume you know she's got her own celebrity and her own following but this is going to increase your profile and if it, if if you come out of it looking bad you might not be able to show your face again on social media it's just going to ruin so many people that's a really tragic part of this like no one really wins because it's been so dragged on it's been so protracted like no one actually wins even Megan if she comes you know she'd be if she leaves this court um, if she leaves this um trial victorious and tory spends 20 plus years in prison she still had to essentially live under the shadow of three years of people thinking that she's some sort of liar that wanted to see an innocent black man go to prison because she didn't want her sex life to be exposed and she and to some people they may never ever get that image of her outside of her head anyway out of their head so it's going to be hard look at chris brown it's been so many years since the whole rihanna thing happened rihanna has publicly forgiven him they're clearly on good terms we've seen many occasions where they've kind of you know hung out with each other or crossed paths and they're clearly being cordial it's all forgiven everything's moved on but still he's suffering a consequences of that of that night where he um hit her in a lamborghini after i think some record of uh, some award show or something so that's a really sad part of it for everybody involved to be honest it's just like nobody ends up winning off the back of this but it has been quite interesting to see all these juicy bits of information be revealed the really interesting part for me and the thing that I was always a bit dubious on and I felt like was just an unnecessary lie. I feel like in most cases, if people lie about really minute, unnecessary things, it kind of puts into question everything they say. And for me, the biggest one at the beginning of the whole thing was just this idea that Megan said, oh, I'd never slept with Tory Lanez. We never had a sexual relationship. I understand maybe in the heat of the moment, because, you know, this guy shot you and you clearly don't like him anymore you're clearly on bad terms maybe before that there was a lot of bad energy around them cool i understand you just want to be like i don't even want to acknowledge that you even were near me in any kind of shape or form but when it turned into a criminal thing and it was you know whatever it may be and it was evolving the courts she should have been honest and just owned up to it and just moved on i think the fact that she denied it for so long it made it seem a little bit crazy because it's like why would this random guy that you're not sleeping with like what why would this why would this happen Jeremy? You know I mean? it just didn't make any sense and it kind of put everything into question and now of course people are kind of dissecting and going through her flipping sexual history and who she's been with and stuff which is obviously to no concern but off the back of saying you didn't hook up with this person and it clearly you did which is the reason why you were all you know heated in the first place and this is why you're you know you basically invited a person there in the first place because you're comfortable with them enough to invite them to such a place as well all those things come into question but in the end we're going to have to wait and see what happens at the end. There's going to be more people kind of come up on the stand. I've read reports that maybe Kylie might get up on there. Maybe Corey Gamble might get up on there. Um, obviously, Kelsey's going to be there. I think Megan might do a bit more cross-examination, which is going to be difficult because she's already crying and you know being very emotional on the stand, which doesn't necessarily bode well for the rest of the court case because I'm assuming they're going to really go in on her and really grill her. Go, you know, in terms of what happened, I'm assuming Tory will go on the stand too, so he's going to have a time to you know to speak his truth or whatever it may be. And then the conclusion is going to be the conclusion. And it's going to be interesting to see what the culture does when it does eventually end, and if it does come out that you know one side lied. Will they give that person grace or will it just be one of those things that's like, yeah, you know, you're found innocent, but we still think you're guilty things the same way with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Who knows, man? But regardless, I don't think anybody wins in this um, scenario. I really don't think anybody wins at all. It's just going to be an absolute horror show for every single person involved. Unfortunately, unfortunately. Next, I quickly wanted to talk about this. This is an interesting one because I don't really know what's happening and what the resolution for something like this is but it seems like academics is legitimately decided to basically you know 
light a fire under his ass and just go in on Adam 22 and no jumper and he's not having it anymore and I think this comes off the back of Flacco who's on no jumper interviewing this guy called Satan Sinner who's been pretty critical of academics online and I think he was the first person to really kind of call him out when he did that whole argument with these girls in some casino somewhere where you were screaming I'm the prize I'm the prize and looking really crazy and all that malarkey and I think he was saying some mad stuff on the Fresh and Fit podcast and this content creator on youtube called satan sinner basically was using the opportunity to basically jump on the clout thing and essentially ride his wave and be the one or two dissenting voices very vocal dissenting voices essentially saying academics is a nerd he's a geek this proves that he's only getting girls because he has money and this is how you act when you were never cool before and just really you know really going hard and really going in on him for the most part and if we know anything about DJ Academics, he's like, he's really very, very successful. He's done amazing to build his platform from the ground up. He's done even amazing, I feel like, more so in terms of turning the public perception around him. Because I feel like there was a time when everybody hated him for sure. But I feel like a lot of people now tolerate him or enjoy their, or enjoy his content. And they aren't afraid to say they watch his stuff. The rappers that go on his show and his podcast. So clearly, he's done a good job in terms of turning that tide um, around. But in general what we do know about academics he is kind of insecure he does seem to really fly off the handle when anybody kind of calls him out and for me that's always really a sign of insecurity when somebody's prone to go all the way to 100 at the slightest hint of a diss or a slight or an insult of any way shape or form and obviously when it hits home it's going to be a little bit more poignant and i think the sentence sinner guy even though he's clout chasing a little bit maybe a lot you know which i you can't really blame the guy because I think if academics was him, he'd probably do the same thing. But because this Sinner Saint Sinner guy is clout chasing off the back of him and, you know, he's calling him out for stuff that's actually true. And a lot of people kind of, you know, recognize, I think a lot of even Axe fans were saying that that whole video with the girls was really corny and lame. He's decided now that anybody who interviews him is basically an op. And obviously Flacco being his protege, and being somebody who kind of looked up to act going on no jumper and interviewing him and essentially giggling along when he's kind of insulting academics, I can see why it didn't sit well. I said at the time when the interview dropped with Flacco and that Satan and Sinner guy, this is not going to end well. This is really a bad look because academics seems the type of person where if you talk with or hang around with people that he doesn't like, he's going to bark on, bark on you completely. He commands or demands actually 100% loyalty, which is weird because I don't feel like he gives that to other people really. He kind of goes where the bag goes. So for him to demand loyalty from people like that is a little bit, you know, it's a little bit iffy, but you know, everyone's got their things. And yeah, I guess he saw the interview finally that Flocker had with Satan and Sinner. He sat down finally and watched it. He didn't like what he saw. But then in the process of dissecting that and get angry at that he's decided to just go ham at flipping Adam 22 and Lena his wife and for me I'd see this sort of stuff and I'm like whoa in no way shape or form is there any kind of comeback from this where you can just say sorry this might have to be one of the situations where you kind of say hey we gotta shoot a fair one just me and you there's no way you can say this about my you know about the mother of my children and me as a person and think everything's going to be okay but adam and academics have a really strange relationship i'm not really sure what's going on but this is academics um part of his stream where he starts barking at the um, adam 22 and leonard the plug nigga i had to go create some shit nigga when, when i was creating my shit Adam was begging me for begging me to fuck his bitch, nigga. That's his wife now, nigga. I ain't trying to Whoa. disrespect this chick, but that's what it is. Nigga, you over here sitting up like a simp. Nigga, I'm over here doing what I do. All of y'all niggas came under act. So I'm trying to tell y'all, y'all tell me what it is. Do y'all want act to be act or do y'all want to show some respect? Because I'm all for everything. I ain't fucking with that. And I ain't gonna lie. Flacco, you could blame Adam because Adam sent me a message. And when Adam said, yo, yeah, I ain't gonna lie, that nigga was sold you out. Oh, damn. Jesus and I ain't gonna look at, I ain't gonna lie. Adam said that. And I looked at it, I said, damn, I thought Flacco was my nigga. And I said, man, niggas must think I'm really pussy out here. Fuck all these niggas. I never did. I never depended on all of y'all. Y'all niggas depend on me. Y'all niggas don't get no views. Y'all niggas don't do shit. I built everything I got. Let me tell you this. Y'all niggas don't get a motherfucking view if act on, on on stream. So 
as you can see, incredibly disrespectful and something that you would imagine most men wouldn't stand for in the slightest. But like I said, academics and Adam 22 have a really strange relationship because it kind of reminds me of this weird interaction they had on live stream, which happened a few years ago. I think it was maybe during the pandemic or maybe just before the pandemic. There, I think this was one of the first times they maybe spoke to each other at length on a stream or something and it was really weird because I felt like academics was really going hard and extra at Adam and basically trying to insinuate that Lena wanted a train ran on her or she did have a train ran on her just some very weird weird things and I was sitting there watching it at the time thinking to myself why isn't Adam barking back at this guy why isn't he standing up for himself a little bit why is he just letting academics just railroad him and kind of punk him out this way like what's the, what the hell is going on I never could really understand what the actual deal was and then I still don't understand what the deal is now but there is something weird going on there. I'm not too sure if Adam is intimidated by academics, whether or not he just wants to be cool and civil and he doesn't want to cause any drama. I'm not really too sure what the issue is, or maybe there is some truth in the whole train thing or what academics is saying about Adam, what, pimping out his own girlfriend or wife at the time or fiance to get clapped. I don't know what the hell's going on, but this is an old clip. This is taken from two years ago. I think it was, maybe it's more than that because this looks a bit too old, but still this is Adam 22 and, and academics going back to back on this live stream. And these are some really disrespectful things here also. Jo oh, no. I can even <laughs> say it's this is an important point though, academics is that what you've said about my girl during the course of this conversation is a thousand times more disrespectful than anything that I ever said about you previously. And, nope. and she's an innocent victim in all this, but you keep nope. talking about her. And it's like, I think everybody, nope. I've, I've seen a glimpse of the comments, but I think everybody seems to agree with me that your whole intentions in this conversation, intentions uh, seem a little weird. <laughs> I do have good intentions. No, my, my intentions is for you to realize that the next time you have Sarah Molina up, you either keep it at 6 9 because keep it real, nobody wants to talk about nothing about her but 6 9 I can't tell you not to talk to, to right, her. Right, but again, you're talking hold on, hold on, about me hold on, literally. Hold on. Oh yeah, now I remember, because that, that was a time when academics was romantically linked to Selena Powell and obviously, um, who's Six Nines baby mother? I forgot they just said her name. But that's when they were going up on No Jumper a lot. And I guess at the time, there was a lot of drama around Selena and academics and people were clowning him for whatever, hooking up with her. And then they kept asking questions about academics and she must have something disparaging about him. And this guy's really interesting academics because he's spends his entire or his entire platform is him speaking about other people right his entire platform is a hip-hop platform where he basically shares clips and interviews and promotes artists and gets paid by labels to put certain things up on there he's essentially like a you know a hip-hop magazine so he does all of that but then if you speak about him ill in in any kind of slight in any kind of you know just even reportage way he gets really 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 annoyed he can't seem to uh take that side of things which is really interesting i find um, I don't really know what the reason is. Maybe because, again, it's an insecurity thing, but you can't be talking all that smack about other people. And then when they speak about you, you kind of fly off the handle, in my opinion. But then what do I know? Hey, having a, Bill, a, a, I, I'm going to guess two minute yo, conversation. I hear, it, I hear that. I hear that. But I could get the chick that claimed that you raped her and have a two minute whoa, conversation. I got and if you, if you end up talking to her for two minutes about me, then I would think it was a strange decision. And again, I never raped anybody. But again, like, I mean, it just seems like a bizarre uh, conflation of things to, to compare. You're right. So how about I think I'm trying to mend this with you, Adam. I love you. What? You know, and I like you too, but again, you keep disrespecting my girl, and I think you owe her an apology to be totally honest, because I know she's sitting at home annoyed by some of the stuff you said about it. You owe me an apology. You think I owe you? I've already given you an apology during this, but again, I'm I'm sorry for misrepresenting you and Six Nines whatever encounter with Selena. I already apologized a long time ago, but I apologized during the stream as well. Also, as you say, you feel I owe whoever an apology. At least I'm only ever I've never talked about any of these things because some of these things you asked me in privacy to take down and not mention. Right, which I did on her behalf for the record. Yo, you have a whole video with three million views with Shorty talking about me on some fake shit. So I owe an apology? You owe me three million apologies. He said I owe an apology. You owe me three million apologies, bro. You owe me three. Hold on, hold on. I'll, let me see how many people watch this, my live. This could get that many views. So I feel like your side of the story is kind of out. Okay, you get the point, it. You get the point. But essentially what I want to get to is that I think my confusion in this matter, or maybe the confusion of other people that are watching it, 
I think we conflate the idea that Adam 22 is a tall white dude with loads of tattoos with him being hard or with him being tough. I don't think that's the case. He's clearly not that guy and he clearly isn't about that time at all. I think if you've seen the video with Kelpie and you know that all my suspect essentially laying the putting the beats on Kelpie with his legs shaking and stuff you see the instant or the automatic reaction of Adam when the fight pops off is to kind of clench up and get all scared and stuff. So that's basically who he is as a person unfortunately in those moments of fight or flight he definitely went to <laughs> went to fly which is you know it is what it is in those moments you don't really know how you're going to react until it happens but i don't know i just would have expected something when it comes to the mother of your children and somebody who's going to end up being your wife that you would just have a line that if somebody crosses you just go beast mode right you just go red you see red nothing else can stop you you have to get your get back or whatever it may be i think of it the same way it's not with a bad kind of really bad connection but i'm thinking about it similar to what was going on with the kardashians and the balenciaga thing but the thing that really surprised me or made me chuckle was that there doesn't seem to be a moral or principled line with them when that whole Balenciaga kids get happened. Even if they don't believe it to be true and they think it's overblown, I just would have expected them to come out and say, yeah, as a mother, this is something that I cannot stand for the foreseeable future. I'll put my partnership with Balenciaga on hold. They just make a definitive statement. Instead, it just said some wishy-washy vague thing. Didn't really draw a line or anything. It made me think, wow, you guys don't really have a line. Like it could be something involving kids, something involving like, you know, insulting your Armenian heritage or whatever it may be and you would still do business with people because they put money in your pocket and maybe the same thing goes with adam because academics is good for business and even you know negativity around him or even him insulting you and your family is going to bring some ice to no jumper and obviously increase what you guys are doing over there then it's all well and good but i just would have expected a little bit more from him given that but again there's probably something else in the background going on that i'm not really too aware of or that the viewers don't really know because i just don't understand you know even if adam is scary even if he is a bit intimidated, even if there is a, you know, we're not over there. I'm in the UK. So maybe there is something about academics and the industry behind the scenes that people don't really know about. And he's really powerful. He's got these connections. Who knows? But I just would have expected a bit more of a visceral reaction to somebody saying what he said about his wife live on stream and whatnot. It just really makes no sense to me. But again, you know, everyone's got their thing that they kind of stand on or don't stand on. And I would love to see how it plays out going forward. And then to make fat matters even funnier and even more strange academics seem to kind of like cross over into my world when it comes into the streetwear fashion side of things because he didn't start getting into it lucas sabat yeah you heard that right academics getting into it with luca fucking sabat how flipping random is that right i don't think anyone had that on their bingo card for 2022 the end of 2022 always goes off with a bang so i guess in the midst of all the drama that academics was having with no jumper adam 22 and the rest of the cast and whatever it may be and flocker of course he also had a bit of beef on the side with young miami because i think at the time news was revealed or did he revealed that he was giving birth to another kid and then the incident went into an uproar because obviously you know he's meant to be having this situation ship going on with uh, young miami from city girls and there's this other lady involved but the lady that got pregnant and had the kid is a completely different person so you know naturally as the internet does they decide to be mean and decide to pile on to young miami and call her out because she's been trying to from what we see in public she's been going out of her way to press diddy to basically claim her in some way shape or form even though he seems to be more open to making it op you know relaxed and whatever it may be just having fun and doing whatever it may be and then in the midst of all of that backlash she was getting online somehow academics gets involved and i think he you know he goes on one of his rants where he maybe talks a bit too spicy she doesn't respond well to it she goes back at him and they're going back and forth on the internet saucy santana gets involved which is funny because you know if, if they're gonna have a fight academics and saucy santana i'm definitely got my money on saucy santana i have to be honest i think he could definitely fight there's something about those i think he's is he from atlanta i'm gonna say atlanta let me just say atlanta there's something about those gay guys that grew up in atlanta they have to put up with a lot of mess they have to defend themselves in the street like i think those guys have hands i think they're those kind of dudes who you think they did you know you think they can't fight just because they're gay and they're extremely effeminate but when it comes down to you know putting the putting their fists up they can they can <laughs> they can get busy because they've been fighting all their life so in the midst of all that drama Lucas Sabat decides to get involved and he tweets what we see here on the screen and I'll read it out for those of you just listening to the audio pod. He says as following, 
Why does DJ Academics only pick smoke with females? I ain't never seen him keep the same energy of another man, which is like the constant meme that's going around now on the internet. But since I've been keeping more, you know, keeping more of an eye on academics and what he's been doing and kind of listening and watching some of his content, that's not necessarily true. Just recently, he went super hard at Little Baby. I think too hard because eventually, if they ever do end up crossing paths, he can never ask for a conversation. That's going to be on-site situation. I'm sure he's aware of it. But the way he's been going at Little Baby was extreme. So he went really hard at Little Baby. Before that, he was going really hard at um, Meek Mill. He's obviously had past smoke with other rappers that maybe aren't as popular. Um, I can think of a D Savage, obviously he went super hard in that. Uh, um, he had the issues with Nav who they kind of made up with, but he has, he's, he's, he's definitely gone his way to really attack those dudes too. My son, maybe he's not somebody super popular, but they seem to always have back and forths. He does seem to bark a lot when people, you know, try to step to him. So this narrative that he only goes against women isn't necessarily true. The one thing you can say as a slight academic definitely makes him look bad is the fact that as a man, he seems to enjoy arguing with women which is something as a gentleman or something as a stand-up guy you probably shouldn't be doing. Going out of your way to insult women and, you know, enjoy arguing them, arguing with them and kind of going back and forth is a little bit part of my French bitch made. That's not the coolest thing to do in the world. And maybe that's generally academics' problem. He's just not cool. He might be incredibly rich, incredibly popular. Um, he's got obviously a very influential platform in terms of his blog and his, sorry, um, you know, his Instagram account and everything that he does on there in terms of social media stuff because he's basically like an online hip hop magazine, basically. But in terms of the cool factor, he isn't. He's the opposite of that. He's basically lame. So I think maybe that's maybe a little insecurity that he can't really get over because, you know, if you're not cool, you can't suddenly be cool just because you have money. If anything, it's going to make you extra lame because now you're just a lame guy with loads of money in your pocket. So that happens. And I think somebody like Lucas Sabat calling him out, who you'd imagine is at the top of the coolness levels, it can maybe rub you up the wrong way. So I can understand why he decided to go a little bit crazy. So he says that, and then academic just decides to go extra, extra hard at Lucas about. And I'm going to play the clips of about three of them back to back, and we're just going to talk about it at the end. But it's just funny to see academics kind of cross over to my world because I would have never have assumed him having a beef with anybody that I'm kind of, you know, adjacent with or near to or you know i have an interest in in terms of the field that i'm kind of into and whatnot but it's just hilarious to see him go at lucas about because funnily enough even though he probably thinks lucas about is a bitch because of what he wears and what he looks like and how he poses if they had to fight too i would put our money on luca as well i have a feeling someone like a luca who grew up in new york who looks the way he does um, had to kind of you know defend himself a few times and try to you know basically remind people that just because I wear high heels doesn't mean I'm a bitch so I'm definitely gonna go for him you know as just a underdog and also you know Lucas Sabat is is in far better shape than academics if Lucas Sabat just to run run you know run in circles around him you'd probably tire him out anyway and be able to put the beats on him so that wouldn't be too difficult but I just love the energy that academics is bringing towards him because he just wants all the smoke all the smoke Pussy nigga like you ain't talking to me, period. Don't act like it's just only for females. Because I've been waiting to at Jersey City. Oh, oh, I got back again. You ain't talking to me, period. Don't act like it's just only for females. Because I've been waiting to catch a nigga Damn. just like you. So pussy nigga, if you want to come meet me, you could come meet me. I'm in Jersey at Jersey City. <laughs> And then the next one. You fuck the females. I believe you. You a bitch. Your mama a bitch. Your daughter a bitch. Fuck everything about you, nigga. Fuck everybody who dead in your family. Come put. I don't think he has a daughter, but I think the whole point of this tirade is just to insult as many people as possible to get Luca to crash out. But I don't think Luca has a daughter. He may have one, but I don't think he does. Up on me. I will meet up with you. Yep. He don't want no smoke. That's what I'm trying to tell you. These Yo. pussy niggas love to say act only. Fucks with females, but I really want it with a nigga like this. I want it. Pause. Hey, I act sound like a girl rapper right now. Hey, yo, he sound hey, like he trying to rap. Act fashion out, boy. Right now. Check the comments. They pressing them. Yo, act. Yo, act. You bro, know, look at this act. pussy nigga. Look, he expected me to spin. Nigga, I never expected you to spin because I don't be spinning. All I'm just trying to say, you said that I only mess with females. I'm just trying to say I'm down to do the disrespect. I'm down to whatever you thought I was disrespect. So that's basically what he said. You know, he basically made it known that he was on whatever smoke he was on. 
But the funny thing is, Luca's response was a little bit underwhelming and kind of disappointing. If somebody decides to talk to you that way, I know you can't be barking on the internet and replying to him. It's a waste of time. I get it. But this did seem a little bit like he was copping, please. So after he said that and academic said what he said, he goes back on his Twitter and somebody says to him on Twitter, he's coming at you really right now on stream. Um, Lucas about replies, damn it, I missed it. Anyone clip it? Laughing emoji. Next tweet, somebody says something else to him. He expects me to spin. I'm an actor. I spend most of my year overseas. Why would I spin a YouTuber, vlogger? I don't advertise being tough, but you do. Which is weird, right? Because you can't get involved in the beef, say what you said there at the bottom, and then suddenly say, but I'm an actor, I'm an actor, I'm an actor. That's a little bit bitch made, in my opinion, as well. Um, if you don't want to get involved, just don't say nothing and keep it moving. But hey, it is what it is. And it continues here, it says, um, yes, I'm pussy. I'll be in Tokyo <laughs> this weekend if you want to spin. That's that's funny and a bit of a flex. Let's be real, right? I'll be in Harajuku <laughs> if you want to come and spin. <laughs> if you want to take a 10, like, imagine taking a 20-hour flight to go and fight someone. <laughs> because they called you out and said that you know you only bully girls that would be absolutely hilarious but anyway that's what happened they went back and forth like i said before i still have my money on luca i think if he just puts on these hulkers and runs around even if he puts on these flipping rico and kiss boots i think he could probably still thump out academics i don't think he can fight in any way shape or form but this made me think in general about what might be at the heart of what's going on with academics. I was thinking to myself, why is this guy always barking and shouting and so loud and aggressive and so quick to anger and go from zero to 100 at the slightest hint of disrespect? And it made me think, this might be all because of what happened when Joe Budden had his little Pasa Pasa with the Migos, RIP to take off during that time, I think at the BET Awards, right? That famous video, I'm sure most of you are aware, where he says, yeah, okay, let's done then. And like, yeah, let's go. And they all stand up in unison and start unbuckling their blouses and whatnot. And then academics is there like terrified, like, you know, fiddling around with a microphone and looking really scary. Then there's another occasion, a public one, where he is, or maybe there's three. The, the other one I'm thinking of is when Vic Mensa suddenly, it finally goes to um, uh, do the show. I think it's called Everyday Struggle with Joe Bunny. I think that's an Everyday Struggle. And I guess academics must have said some stuff about Vic Mensa in the past or Vic Mensa didn't like his Warren Chirac stuff, whatever happened. But Vic Mensa essentially put him, you know, put him on the spot and kind of pressed him and said, yeah, you know, I would do such and such to you or something. I forgot what he said specifically, but it might be something about slapping someone. But essentially academics didn't bark the way he does on the internet when Vic Mensa approached him in person. And then the third kind of, you know, a bit of a wild card edition might be the entire tenure that he had with Joe Budden on Everyday Struggle where Joe Budden spent most of his time just shouting at him and essentially kind of bullying him on the show and calling him out and you know basically insinuating that he's dumb he doesn't get anything so I think all those public occasions where he was kind of disrespecting and he didn't react in the right way they've kind of really they're sitting on his consciousness and he can't get rid of it this feeling that everyone thinks he's a pussy so that's why maybe he's overcompensating and shouting so hard and going so aggressive on the internet because he wants to get his get back but that made me think oddly enough about this thing that i had one time which made basically made me go and start doing martial arts and be a position where i'm like waiting for someone to try something so i could get my get back one time in school i had like this the most embarrassing story ever i think i might have been in like year 11 or year 10 or something so it wasn't even like i was in year seven it was like really old and i guess i had my first proper fight with like a guy in a school before i had maybe some skirmishes with people you can beat up you know some scrawny white boy you know he can thump or some asian dude or something but i had like an actual fight with a fellow black guy right and he was of size you know we were both athletic at the time we could both punch both hit so it was going to be like an actual scrap an actual scrap sorry where you know it could go badly it could end badly for either one of us and i think we had the scrap because of some football thing i think it was you know some beef about football i would i always had beef around football because i'd always never get picked for stuff and i always felt like i should be getting picked and that's where all my struggles with football came from right because i always thought i was flipping figo in my head but i guess the managers and the coaches didn't really agree so something about football happened i don't know what exactly the issue was but me and this guy in my year get into an argument and again we're in the same school same year somehow we get into some argument and it's like yeah all right cool let's fight after the game yeah 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 fight after the game 
And if, if you guys are from East, you know where Once the Flats is. And we went there. And I think they was playing football there. And we started to fight in the car park of Once the Flats, which is basically this area that, you know, it's got all these pitches around there. And there's like a little place where you can go and change like a toilet. And it's got like a car park where people um, come in and whatnot. And we decided to go and fight there. I'm sure there's been plenty of fights over the years. And then we're fighting. We decided to start fighting. And it's kind of all gravelly on the floor. And we're fighting. We're all swinging. Like, you know, that kind of tense, like... <laughs> You're just really tense and you're tight and your your heart is beating and you're just kind of swinging all adrenaline. We're swinging and missing, swinging and missing, swinging and missing. And then I guess he goes to swing and because it's really gravelly, the floor, he slips and my eyes light up. I'm like, oh my God, he slips my chance. I go to go and punch him, but obviously him being a good fighter, he's able to duck my punch as I'm going to punch him. He's on the floor. And I think I hit him maybe once, but he somehow finds a way to slip my punch as he's falling backwards. I'm leaning all my weight into the punch. He slips backwards, stands up, and then somehow ends up behind me. <laughs> and all I remember seeing was like flashes, like... Doo -doo 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 -doo. I'm getting beat in the back of my head and I'm trying to get up and I'm just, and I know by that time I'm losing now because he's got six punches in like unanswered and I'm just trying to protect my head. Then as I get up and as I square back up again to fight again, I see him and he's just like got that, you know, when you're fighting somebody and you know you've won, he's got that confident shrug now. His shoulders are nice and loose. He's bouncing up and down. He's looking at me. He's looking, he's looking at me. He's making me flinch. He's doing all that. And then for some reason, I don't know what came over me. I just ran. <laughs> I just started running. <laughs> I just started running. And I remember hearing my friends, Agostino, Agostino, where you going? Where you going? Come on, come on. And the guy starts running. And more embarrassing, he runs after me for a little bit. And I'm running for my life now because now he's running after me. But then he just stops. And it's like, yeah, he's got that kind of, he's got that licking. And then, and then this must have happened like on like a Tuesday. And then school the next day on a Wednesday. Oh, so embarrassing going to school the next day. Everyone's looking at you like you're a pussy. And then it's what you basically are because you ran away. And then I, I'm in school and then everyone's looking at a person and I'm wanting to fight everyone and staring at me and I'm just really angry and pissed off. And I really don't know why I even ran because maybe at the time, I guess I was just scared. I thought I was going to get beaten up, whatever it may be, crazy stuff. So I ended up running away. And at that time, it's like year 10, year 11. So I must have been like 14, 15. And it was really embarrassing. I kind of hated it and it kind of made school a bit tough that year, right? <laughs> but I remember that sitting with me for a long time. Like it sat with me for years to the point where I was doing a bit of Muay Thai. Um, obviously, I did a bit of judo for a little bit. I did fencing. I did loads of combat type sport things just to put me in a position where I felt like, okay, if this ever transpired again, I'm going to go to 100. And even to this day, I'm a really well-mannered, chill type of dude. I don't really... You know, I'm not quick to anger in any type of way, but I have been known to get into crazy scuffles and arguments in the weirdest places, like, you know, in the flipping queue in flipping Tesco Express. I'm barking and just, you know, threatening to throw some guy through a window because he decided to bump me in a queue or something or whatever it may be. Like, I, I get to that level. And I think most of that has come from me thinking, OK, I don't ever want to be in a position where I feel scared or I feel threatened or i feel worried for my life where i'm gonna run away again i'm never gonna do that i'm gonna die on my sword right here right now i'm gonna die over this flipping tesco express queue and you know your mom's gonna cry my mom's gonna cry <laughs> it's gonna be a situation and i think that's what's going on with academics i think it's the same thing i think since that migos thing since the whole vic mentor thing he just hasn't been able to sleep well at night since those occasions and he knows how people look at him especially with him being a fat you know, and him being opinionated because of Chattanooga and being kind of lame and whatever it may be, there's all these little hurdles he has to jump over. And then he's got that other thing as well, the kind of, the, you know, people looking at him like he's a pussy. So he kind of wants to try to reclaim it and kind of remind people that he's not. But unfortunately for him, the only way for him to reclaim his honour is for him to just step to somebody and beat the brakes off them. Any skirmish he gets into, he has to get to a point where he decides, okay, I'm going to go in, jump in my flipping Lamborghini Urus and I'm going to drive to you and I'm going to beat the brakes off of you. That's what he has to do and hopefully film it so people see evidence of it. That's what you have to do. There's no other way to get it back because at this point, he's just barking into his camera on live stream and it looks 
extra extra lame because you're really aggressive on the camera but no one's ever seen you this aggressive in person we've seen you on two occasions where you know you were pressed and you're put in a position where you had to kind of maybe show your toughness and you didn't show it so now barking in camera and kind of you know arguing with gay guys arguing with fashion dudes and actors arguing with women it just looks weird it just or arguing with every rapper that kind of insults you it just looks really strange so i think unfortunately for academics the only way he can get his get back the only way he can fix this is if he picks a victim, whoever it may be, you know, sometimes if you're in a fight or you're getting rushed, sometimes if you're getting rushed by boys um, or, or by whatever ops, the best thing to do is to grab the biggest one and just start tumping him in. So even if you do get punched up, at least you send a message and one person goes home with a bloody eye or a fucked up face. You have to do that. So I think in this case, he just has to get somebody and just absolutely de demolish them. It's really <laughs> terrible to say this, but I think that's the only way he's going to sleep well at night because I know how hard it was for me to sleep well at night knowing that I ran away from a fight when I was like 15 years old and since then I've been on pure you know aggression from then on if anybody says to me wrong I'm just gonna go all the way to the end and I think kind of academics need to realize that that's what he needs to do going forward but you know maybe he'll realize it maybe he won't and then talking about aggression I have a tendency sometimes to react very aggressive when people decide to you know jump the queue I don't know what it is about cues. Maybe it's the maybe it's the silent agreement that we all have where we're all deciding to be adults and, you know, kind of respect each other and say, yeah, you're behind me, you're in front of me and all that stuff, especially when it comes to a club like Berghain, where usually on most popular days or most of the time in the year, there's definitely going to be a queue of maybe a minimum of 30 minutes, max, maybe four hours. So it's pretty important to make sure that everyone kind of has this silent agreement that we're all going to be in the line together and no one's going to jump the queue. No one's going to be, you know, disrespectful or whatnot. But in some cases, or especially most recently, I felt like there's been a real uptick with the amount of people that decide to queue jump when it comes to Burkhan. And it's really, really annoying. I have to be completely honest. And for me, I've always had a very visceral reaction to queue jumpers, which might go back to my days of queuing up outside of, you know, streetwear stores and sneaker stores back in the day to buy limited edition shoes, to flip on eBay so I can pay myself for uni or so I can buy more expensive streetwear stuff to make myself feel cool and validated. I'm not too sure why. But I think maybe at that time when I was really young, like 18 or whatnot, and you're getting all these older quote unquote guys jumping the queue and basically rendering your overnight stay, sleeping on a sleeping bag or on a chair upright, rendering it mute by basically jumping the queue or saying that they know the flipping owner, that re probably set with me, that, that resentment. So now if I ever see it happening in my you know adult life i have to say something so I'm, when i'm reading these accounts of people who are getting really upset at people jumping the queue i'm thinking to myself why would they ever allow it i would never allow anybody in their life to ever jump in the queue with me at Berghain. and the thing is i understand the hesitancy not to say nothing because essentially the etiquette around Berghain when you're in a queue is to always be in your best behavior because you want to increase your chances of getting inside and it's probably the most well-behaved queue in in the world when it comes to club culture so everybody's kind of very cognitive or aware of making sure they don't you know act out or do anything naughty that they would do in maybe other places they go um people don't go too crazy and whatnot there's still a bit of drinking there and people are doing whatever they're doing but for the most part everyone's usually well behaved so i understand the tendency not to say something because you don't want to have a you know a, a kind of uh, a very loud and aggressive interaction with somebody or confrontation and then have the bouncers see that and essentially say yeah you're definitely not getting in because you're coming in with a bad vibe but for me personally whenever i've seen it happen and usually i've been lucky enough where i can stop it because usually if somebody's trying to queue jump they're always trying to for me for the most part i feel like they're always trying to queue jump around this part here which if you can't see in the screen but essentially it's where the bars and the barriers are i feel like just before there's where people usually try and queue jump because that's the you know that's the advantage of trying to queue jump what's up on a queue jumper from the back so people try and usually go in around towards the front and usually around here it's a bit easier to stop somebody because you can just stop them you know you can just maybe block the thing that you're standing on or just say nah you're not going to let four or seven people in because that's the other thing too that's really annoying when people queue jump it's not like they're queue jumping for one person just to meet their friend oh my friend's up there do you mind even if it's not their friend you let them through anyway it's usually more than two people all the time and for me i just never allow it because if i'm standing out there for an hour plus 
the last thing I think is fair is for you to just queue jump because you don't want to wait the two hours that you're now going to wait because the queue is longer than what it was when I first joined. It just is what it is. And the other thing that's incredibly annoying about it also is that for the most part, I think most people are pretty reasonable in the queue and pretty, you know, chill. If you'd ask them, they'd probably let you go. They'd probably let you jump in or stand with them or stand behind them. It probably wouldn't be that much of an issue. But I feel like the arrogance and the entitlement of just deciding, no, I'm going to go in this way is just really horrible. There's another little caveat behind it, where is, which is I've heard people say most of the people that queue jump are regulars. So they're people who maybe go to Berghain all the time or live in Berlin. And they kind of have this sense that they should be allowed to queue jump because this is their hometown this is their home club this is a local club whatever it may be and you know locals get priority over tourists which i can kind of understand to a certain extent you know it might be annoying if you go to bergen every weekend and then just because it's a popular weekend all the tourists come and you're having to wait for seven hours while all these people you know from wherever that clearly aren't going to get in are wasting their time taking up space in the queue but I just think when it comes to the Q politics and dynamics and whatnot, you just have to obey the silent agreement that we all have where we're all going to wait in line and we're all going to be fair and we're not going to Q jump. I just think it's better that way because I don't know. I'd, personally, for me, I'd never do that to somebody. I literally won't. I'd, I'd much rather ask somebody, which I wouldn't also because I don't like, you know, asking for those kind of things just doesn't make any sense i'm just standing in a queue and wait you know the longest i've ever had to wait to go in Bergheim was four hours i waited for four hours but i still got in do you know what i mean it's not that big of a deal and if you don't get in you're in a city with some of the you know with, with, you're in a city that has some of the you know the most clubs ever in the world i reckon probably per flipping square meters it's not that big of a deal but i just can't understand people who don't say anything that's the thing that really trips me out. Like who legitimately let people just go in front of them all day long. It just, it, it amazes me. I think now it might not be that much of an issue, especially now if I decide to go in that January, February time, because usually those are the colder months and they're not the most popular times to go, but definitely the best I feel like in terms of, you know, getting a real understanding or a feel for what that club is about, especially Panorama Bar. I feel like it's always the best around the new year time. For me personally, the first four months of the year, Panorama Bar is usually brilliant. Um, the vibe is usually electric. The Berkheim main floor is usually pretty decent also. Um, but with it being cold, you're probably not going to get that much people queue jumping and whatnot. But last year when I went around June and stuff, whoa, I got into a couple of, you know, spats, I'd say, with people in the queue, which is annoying because then you end up seeing them in there and they're all nice and huggy and like, oh my God, sorry about earlier. But it's like, why did you do that? You nearly ruined my mood going in just so you could what we could all meet each other at the same time because we you, we know most likely you're going to get in because if you're queue jumping you're probably confident enough that you're going to get inside right or you just want to maybe just get it over and done with in case you don't but just no need for it just let respect everybody queue is normally and let everybody get in on time i think that's the best way to go about things but you know i understand maybe when you're there it's a bit different and you want to change things up a bit next i went to quickly talk about was this it's been pretty interesting to see everyone reacting to this on social media and it's been pretty um, encouraging also so this guy decided to upload a video of somebody enjoying themselves. I think at like a fuse marathon, if I'm not mistaken, which is maybe a really interesting and conflicting mix of people when it comes to fuse, the promoter who's usually doing loads of deep house, um, I don't know, melodic, no, it was not really melodic, maybe deep house and tech house type of vibes. And then, you know, fusing it with the, the flipping people that go to Fabric or just Fabric as an institution overall, especially how it's trying to, you know, go nowadays. It's probably a bit more of a clash than you probably would have wanted. But regardless, this guy decided to post a video on Twitter of somebody having a good time and dancing their face off and absolutely going crazy in there and having a great time and just, you know, enjoying themselves as you would do in a nightclub. And the, But I think obviously the bad thing of it was the flipping, um, was the tweet itself above the video, which says, yo, I'll never be going to fabric again after seeing this, which is essentially trying to infer that maybe because the guy may look like he's from the queer LGBTQ plus community that, you know, he's not going to go there because he doesn't want to be around, you know, gay people for the most part. I don't know. Or maybe he's just too freaky. I don't know. Whatever the thing is, it's not a nice thing to say about somebody. And I do like the response from Fabric. They clearly saw the video because it's got over 200,000 views. I'm not going to play it because, you know, what's the point? But, Fabric's response after the guy's tweet was as follows. Great. Given his tweet, we'd prefer it if he didn't come. 
Our club was built on the values of free expression and freedom to dance and not be judged. We also have a no photo policy to protect our dancers, sorry, privacy. Please do the right thing and remove the video. Obviously he hasn't because he's getting a lot of clout with that video and it's got 200,000 views. But I do like the response from people in the community who decided to just rip into the guy and essentially you know, restore the feeling, I feel like, in terms of people's understanding, in terms of how to behave when it comes to clubs and what nightlife is about and, you know, the freedom of expression and all that good stuff. It's really nice to see. Heidi Lorden, who I've got a lot of time for, big up her. She says, everyone else that goes to Fabric breathes collective sigh of relief. There's always weather spoons for you. Also, isn't there no phone policy? Massive invasion of privacy. Now broadcast publicly. I hope he consults a lawyer. So everybody's kind of going at him there. Posthuman says, everyone hating on this dancer. In the replies, I hope none of you come to my club night. Stay your towny mainstream night um, last night at home. Another person there says, um, Heidi, someone says here, have some respect, lads. Michael's a legend and we wouldn't have clubs like Fabric if it wasn't for people like him. How is this in any way harming you? Dance somewhere else if you have such babies. If you're such babies, club culture welcomes everyone and put your phones away. And then, you know, standard kind of replies. And then Fabric decided to get involved also and really laid the law down and said as follows. Yesterday, we made it aware that the club, the, the tweet was circulating v featuring a video of a dance at the club. We have requested that due to the mat nature of the caption and the context in which it was taken, that the video removed, your first would be given a lifetime ban crazy we have a no photo policy to protect the club's privacy everyone who should be express themselves freely at fabric which is great to see right awesome 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 to see but the interesting part for me is that this kind of illustrates the struggle that london or the uk is always going to have when we try to implement these kind of like you know berlin-esque um policies around no photos and the dance floor and people just enjoying themselves because i just feel like we're just not a well-behaved country nightlife wise we may be culturally maybe a little bit behind some other places in terms of really fully accepting people um expressing themselves exactly how they want to be which is why we maybe have such an abundance of these alternative queer flinter lgbtq plus nights popping up all over the place because those people don't essentially feel seen or protected or safe in these mainstream quote-unquote clubs so they go into these different places or setting up their own events or throwing their own parties whatever it may be called but there is a effort being made especially fabric to try to rewrite the wrongs and to try to set a new precedent and to try to invite and welcome more people into the space so it is a little bit more representative of what the club scene actually is like because there was a time before where fabric was very lads heavy was very minimal heavy was very like everyone basically looked like a carbon copy of raresh if you know who that dj is right in terms of their look and what they were into the girls had a particular look about them but it was a particular kind of aesthetic that kind of went in there overall i remember one time in there i was there a few maybe months ago you know you see people that you know look like essentially they only go out just to get fucked up no one's really going there for the music everyone's just going there to go dance and basically go and take illicit materials and drink whatever they need to take but over time i felt like especially within the last 18 months the programming at fabric has been incredible they've clearly tried to come out of their comfort zone and for me the most definiting factor because i was one of the people that hated going there especially when it came to the searches because i remember going to fabric back in the day when they used to have dogs there right sniffer dogs in fucking fabric crazy times but I remember the searches being horrendous. They always will be vibe killer, even though they've improved them in terms of streamlining them. So it doesn't feel too much like a hassle. It still is a little bit of a vibe killer. But, you know, all clubs basically do the same thing without maybe the addition of the pictures and all this other stuff. But the one thing they've done, which I feel like has made the biggest difference, in my opinion, in terms of changing their fortunes around, aside from the, you know, opening the doors to more alternative promoters and different DJs and, you know, the whole resident DJ thing has been opened up a bit more to different various type of people in terms of what they look like and ages and whatnot blah 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 the most important thing for me has been the no photos policy legit still you'll see on some weekends if you click on the hashtag or you go on fabric on a week you'll see some people uploading pictures but for the most part if you're actually in there the vibe is so much better without people taking pictures and phone whatever maybe because fabric is also known as a place where you know if you want to take a video or a picture it's pretty well 
spec'd out in a way your videos would look amazing from the lighting the smoke the sound insulation how dark it is it looks incredible when you actually take in your smartphone but the fact that they've implemented that rule the fact that before you go in they ask you to put a sticker on your phone or i think they put it on for you actually before you go in so it's actually enforced it does go a long way to improving the vibe in there because people legitimately don't feel like they're being seen or that they're being watched at all times and they do enjoy themselves and spread themselves a bit more freely than they would do in, in days gone by now this fuse event's a bit weird because like i said fuse is a bit of a laddie type of event um you know it's very tech house based and a lot of those guys i wouldn't ex assume would be that comfortable seeing somebody you know as the guy is there in the video scantily clad dancing and doing his thing and enjoying himself they naturally wouldn't you know get it in the same way but i do like the response that regardless if it was fuse or whatever it may be they have a particular way that they want their club to be and they want people to abide by the rules and if you don't then you know you get the lifetime ban which has been great to see but it does represent a little bit of a it does kind of illustrate the struggles of london nightlife in terms of i won't say educating but in terms of um getting people to agree to those type of things is very difficult or people to even to get it like you know the no photo policy thing is becoming a big deal here in london which is shouldn't really be but then imagine if we decide to implement stuff like door picking which some events do especially the ones that are involved in the queer lgbtq and flinter community they definitely do door picking and they and i've seen it before where they'll turn some people away which is pretty funny to see because it never happens in london and people are always shocked like what i've got money though right because you know in other places it doesn't matter if you've got money you just aren't going to come in um but imagine how much of a fuss people would kick up if they decided to introduce door picking in london it would be absolutely crazy especially with all our you know issues that we already have especially in central london clubs with you know people not there not being the most friendliest when it comes to people you know that look like me over there imagine that gets extended into like you know our bit of the community where they're starting to like say nah you can't come in because you know mm -hmm. and then you can't come where do you draw the line in that regard but this shows the struggle that's happening at the moment and how to kind of make it work but the response of everybody's been encouraging everyone basically chastised the guy ripped into him and you know he didn't mind it because i'm sure he doesn't really give a fuck and probably isn't going to go back to fabric anytime soon because he probably went there only for fuse but still i love the fact that fabric took that stance and decided to go like that and i also like the fact that everyone kind of responded the way they did because it basically showed that there is a shift happening over there and it's not just a dreary old you know horrible tense vibe killer place that it was in the past it's definitely freshened up a little bit it feels nicer room two is you know maybe one of the best rooms in london in terms of a club space i've ever been in the acoustics in there are absolutely incredible the staff in there are usually brilliant they always have good people booking there it's maybe a bit of a mission for me to go and i hate the stairs and all that malarkey and the fucking cloak room being where it is and all that stuff but apart from that it's still one of our best clubs we have in london and the fact that they're trying to you know drag it kicking and screaming into the 21st century has been amazing to see to be honest because it clearly shows that it's difficult to do but it is it can be done so bigger fabric for doing what they did and you know and hopefully that is a lesson to all people that hey when you're on the dance floor enjoy yourself put your phone in your pocket and just have a good time honestly the no photo policy thing can be annoying i understand for some people because you know it's my phone i can do what i want i get it but please, honestly, you will enjoy yourself far better if you just put your phone in your pocket and you actually go and enjoy yourself for the most part. Like, I don't know what people do when they go to gigs, but when I go to a gig, like to watch a band or an artist perform, for the most part, I may take like max three pictures, maybe something, oh, here I am, my favorite song or me singing along. And then for the most part, you actually want to enjoy the show. Just stand there and recording it on your phone, watching it through your phone's a bit boring. Same thing goes for a nightclub. If you're going to go out there, even if you are going to go and just drink a lot and take loads of drugs, maybe focus on that more than actually your phone because it kind of takes you out the moment, in my opinion, personally. And plus, especially in places like, you know, Fabric, they've got the, the, the flipping, um, the set list or who's gonna play or whatnot already printed on the on the things so you don't even need to take your phone out they've got all that printed you can just check it at a glance and see who's coming on next and whatnot they've got comfortable seats you can sit down on free water everywhere a good little smoking room you can go to also a smoking area sorry it's like it's a decent place to hang out and just enjoy the music i don't know if people want to be on their phone all the time and it's always kind of really weird strange mix of people because it's it's in a weird strange place as well it's kind of central kind of isn't so there's a weird really strange convolution of people that always kind of cross in there so it's pretty interesting to have conversations with some mum or some guy that's a finance guy or some dude that's a flipping you know that's a student just hanging out whatever it may be that's always pretty interesting 
but hey, what do I know? What do I know? So that is 6.30 of the Action of Zinger Show. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. As per usual, if you want to check out more things regarding myself, you know what to do. You go at the link below in it, right? 630. <laughs> there should be a link below um, on my podcast there. You can check. If you listen to the audio podcast, you should see a link to my website, actionzinger.com, in the description box as well. So click that if you want to find out more information regarding myself. And I'll be with you guys again very, very soon. If you listen to the audio podcast, as usual, you'll hear my tune of the day. But if you're watching the video, you won't hear any tunes. So if you want to hear my tunes of the day, make sure you subscribe to the podcast down below and just fast forward to the end and you'll hear the kind of tunes that I'm into. So far, I've been, I've been going pretty hard in the tunes I'm selecting. So hopefully you enjoy. Take care. Be well.